Hannibal. Hannibal Barca, HMBLBRQ, 247, between 183 and 181 BC, was a Carthaginian general, considered one of the greatest military commanders in history. His father Hamilcar Barca was the leading Carthaginian commander during the First Punic War. His younger brothers were Mago and Hasdrubal, and he was brother in law to Hasdrubal the Fair. Hannibal lived during a period of great tension in the western Mediterranean basin, when the Roman Republic established its supremacy over other great powers such as ancient Carthage, the Etruscans, the Samnites, and the Greek kingdom of Syracuse. One of his most famous achievements was at the outbreak of the Second Punic War, when he marched an army which included war elephants from Iberia over the Pyrenees and the Alps into Italy. In his first few years in Italy, he won dramatic victories at the Trebia, Lake Trasimene, and Cannae. He distinguished himself for his ability to determine Heiss and his opponents' respective strengths and weaknesses, and to plan battles accordingly. Hannibal's well-planned strategies allowed him to conquer Manyales of Rome. Hannibal occupied most of Italy for 15 years but was unable to march on Rome. An enemy counter-invasion of North Africa forced him to return to Carthage, where he was decisively defeated by Scipio Africanus at the Battle of Zama. Scipio had studied Hannibal's tactics and brilliantly devised some of his own, and he finally defeated Rome's nemesis at Zama, having previously driven Hannibal's brother Hasdrubal out of the Iberian Peninsula. After the war, Hannibal successfully ran for the office of Sufet. He enacted political and financial reforms to enable the payment of the war indemnity imposed at B. Rome, however, those reforms were unpopular with members of the Carthaginian aristocracy and in Rome and he fled into voluntary exile. During this time, he lived at the Seleucid court, where he acted as military advisor to Antiochus III the Great in his war against Rome. Antiochus met defeat at the Battle of Magnesia and was forced to accept Rome's terms, and Hannibal fled again, making a stop in the kingdom of Armenia. His flight ended in the court of Bithynia, where he achieved an outstanding naval victory against a fleet from Pergamon. He was afterwards betrayed to the Romans and committed suicide by poisoning himself. Hannibal is often regarded as one of the greatest military strategists in history and one of the greatest generals of Mediterranean antiquity, together with Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and Scipio Africanus. Plutarch states that Scipio asked Hannibal who was the greatest general, and Hannibal replied either Alexander or Pyrrhus, then himself, or Pyrrhus, Scipio, then himself, according to another version of the event. Military historian Theodore Dodge called Hannibal the father of strategy, because his enemy Rome adopted elements of his military tactics in its own strategic arsenal. This praise has earned him a strong reputation in the modern world, and he was regarded as a great strategist by Napoleon and others. The English form of the name is derived from the Latin. Greek historians rendered the name as Annabas Barcus. Hannibal was his given name. Hannibal's name was recorded in Carthaginian sources as HNBL, in Punic. Its precise vocalization remains a matter of debate. Suggested readings include Hannibal or Hannibal, meaning grace of Baal, Baal is gracious, or Baal has been gracious, or Hannibal, with the same meaning. Barca, BRQ, was the surname of his aristocratic family, meaning shining or lightning. It is thus equivalent to the Arabic name Bark or the Hebrew name Barak or the ancient Greek epithet Karaunos, which was commonly given to military commanders in the Hellenistic period. In English, his clan are sometimes collectively known as the Barsids. As with Greek and Roman practice, patronymics were a common part of Carthaginian nomenclature, so that Hannibal would also have been known as Hannibal son of Hamilcar. Hannibal was one of the sons of Hamilcar Barca, a Carthaginian leader. He was born in what is present-day Tunisia. He had several sisters and two brothers, Hasdrubal and Mago. His brothers-in-law were Hasdrubal the Fair and the Numidian king Narabas. He was still a child when his sisters married, and his brothers-in-law were close associates during his father's struggles in the mercenary war and the Punic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. In light of Hamilcar Barca's cognomen, historians referred to Hamilcar's family as the Barsids. However, there is debate as to whether the cognomen Barca meaning thunderbolt, was applied to Hamilcar alone or was hereditary within his family. If the latter, then Hannibal and his brothers also bore the name Barca. After Carthage's defeat in the First Punic War, Hamilcar set out to improve his family's and Carthage's fortunes. With that in mind and supported by goddess, Hamilcar began the subjugation of the tribes of the Iberian Peninsula. Carthage at the time was in such a poor state that it lacked a navy able to transport his army, instead, 
Hamilcar had to march his forces across Numidia towards the Pillars of Hercules and then cross the Strait of Gibraltar. According to Polybius, Hannibal much later said that when he came upon his father and begged to go with him, Hamilcar agreed and demanded that he swear that as long as he lived he would never be a friend of Rome. There is even an account of him at a very young age, nine years old, begging his father to take him to an overseas war. In the story, Hannibal's father took him up and brought him to a sacrificial chamber. Hamilcar held Hannibal over the fire roaring in the chamber and made him swear that he would never be a friend of Rome. Other sources report that Hannibal told his father, I swear so soon as age will permit, I will use fire and steel to arrest the destiny of Rome. According to the tradition, Hannibal's oath took place in the town of Peniscola, today part of the Valencian community, Spain. Hannibal's father went about the conquest of Hispania. When his father drowned in battle, Hannibal's brother-in-law Hasdrubal the Fair succeeded to his command off the army with Hannibal, then 18 years old, serving as an officer under him. Hasdrubal pursued a policy of consolidation of Carthage's Iberian interests, even signing a treaty with Rome whereby Carthage would not expand north of the Ebro so long as Rome did not expand south of it. Hasdrubal also endeavored to consolidate Carthaginian power through diplomatic relationships with native tribes. Upon the assassination of Hasdrubal in 221 BC, Hannibal, now 26 years old, was proclaimed commander-in-chief by the army and confirmed in his appointment by the Carthaginian government. The Roman scholar Livy gives a depiction of the young Carthaginian, no sooner had he arrived, the old soldiers fancied they saw Hamilcar in his youth given back to them, the same bright look, the same fire in his eye, the same trick of countenance and features. Never was one in the same spirit more skillful to meet opposition, to obey, or to command. And Livy also records that Hannibal married a woman of Castulo, a powerful Spanish city closely allied with Carthage. The Roman epic poet Silius Italicus names her as Imils. Silius suggests a Greek origin for Imils, but Gilbert Charles Picard argued for a Punic heritage based on an etymology from the Semitic root MLK chief, the king. Silius also suggests the existence of a son, whom is otherwise not attested by Livy, Polybius, or Appian. After he assumed command, Hannibal spent two years consolidating his holdings and completing the conquest of Hispania, south of the Ebro. In his first campaign, Hannibal attacked and stormed the Alcade's strongest center, Alithia, which promptly led to their surrender, and brought Punic power close to the river Tagus. His following campaign in 220 BC was against the Vaxway to the west, where he stormed the Vaxan strongholds of Helmantis and Arbacala. On his return home, Laden with many spoils, a coalition of Spanish tribes, led by the Carpatani, attacked, and Hannibal won his first major battlefield success and showed off his tactical skills at the Battle of the River Tagus. However, Rome, fearing the growing strength of Hannibal in Iberia, made an alliance with the city of Saguntum, which lay a considerable distance south of the river Ebro and claimed the city as its protectorate. Hannibal not only perceived this as a breach of the treaty signed with Hasdrubal, but as he was already planning an attack on Rome, this was his way to start the war. So he laid siege to the city, which fell after eight months. Hannibal sent the booty from Saguntum to Carthage, a shrewd move which gained him much support from the government. Livy records that only Hanoed Great spoke against him. In Rome, the Senate reacted to this apparent violation of the treaty by dispatching a delegation to Carthage to demand whether Hannibal had destroyed Saguntum in accordance with orders from Carthage. The Carthaginian Senate responded with legal arguments observing the lack of ratification by either government for the treaty alleged to have been violated. The delegation's leader, Quintus Fabius Maximus Ferrucosus, demanded Carthage chose between war and peace, to which his audience replied that Rome could choose. Fabius chose war. This journey was originally planned by Hannibal's brother-in-law Hasdrubal the Fair who became a Carthaginian general in the Iberian Peninsula in 229 BC he maintained this post for eight years until 221 BC. Soon the Romans became aware of an alliance between Carthage and the Celts of the Po Valley in northern Italy. The Celts were amassing forces to invade farther south in Italy, presumably with Carthaginian backing. Therefore, the Romans preemptively invaded the Po region in 225 BC. By 220 BC, the Romans had annexed the area as Cisalpine Gaul. Hasdrubal was assassinated around the same time, 221 BC, bringing Hannibal to the fore. It seems that the Romans lulled themselves into a false sense of security, having dealt with the threat of a Gallo-Carthaginian invasion, and perhaps knowing that the original Carthaginian commander had been killed. 
Hannibal departed New Carthage in late spring of 218 BC. He fought his way through the northern tribes to the foothills of the Pyrenees, subduing the tribes through clever mountain tactics and stubborn fighting. He left a detachment of 20,000 troops to garrison the newly conquered region. At the Pyrenees, he released 11,000 Iberian troops who showed reluctance to leave their homeland. Hannibal reportedly entered Gaul with 40,000 foot soldiers and 12,000 horsemen. Hannibal recognized that he still needed to cross the Pyrenees, the Alps, and many significant rivers. Additionally, he would have to contend with opposition from the Gauls, whose territory he passed through. Starting in the spring of 218 BC, he crossed the Pyrenees and reached the Rhone by conciliating the Gaulish ships along his passage before the Romans could take any measures to bar his advance, arriving at the Rhone in September. Hannibal's army numbered 38,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry, and 38 elephants, almost none of which would survive the harsh conditions of the Alps. Hannibal outmaneuvered the natives who had tried to prevent his crossing, then evaded a Roman force marching from the Mediterranean coast by Turningeinland up the valley of the Rhone. His exact route over the Alps has been the source of scholarly dispute ever since. Polybius, the surviving ancient account closest in time to Hannibal's campaign, reports that the route was already debated. The most influential modern theories favor either a march up the valley off the Drome and a crossing of the main range to the south of the modern highway over the Col de Montgenever or a march farther north up the valleys of the Isar and Arc crossing the main range near the present Col de Montanissini or the Little St. Bernard Pass. Recent numismatic evidence suggests that Hannibal's army may have passed within sight of the Matterhorn. Stanford geoarchaeologist Patrick Hunt argues that Hannibal took the Col de Clapier mountain pass claiming the Clapier most accurately met ancient depictions of the route, wide view of Italy, pockets of year-round snow, and a large campground. Other scholars have doubts, proposing that Hannibal took the easier route across Petty Mount Sini. Hunt responds to this by proposing that Hannibal's Celtic guides purposefully misguided the Carthaginian general. By Livy's account, the crossing was accomplished in the face of huge difficulties. These Hannibals are mounted with ingenuity, such as when he used vinegrant fire to break through a rock fall. According to Polybius, he arrived in Italy accompanied by 20,000 foot soldiers, 4,000 horsemen, and only a few elephants. The fired rock fall event is mentioned only by Livy. Polybius is mute on the subject and there is no evidence of carbonized rock at the only two tier rock fall in the Western Alps, located below the Col de la Traversette, Mahaney, 2008. If Polybius is correct in his figure for the number of troops that he commanded after the crossing of the Rhone, this would suggest that he had lost almost half of his force. Historians such as Serge Lancel have questioned the reliability of death figures for the number of troops that he had when he left Hispania. From the start, he seems to have calculated that he would have to operate without aid from Hispania. Hannibal's vision of military affairs was derived partly from the teaching of his Greek tutors and partly from experience gained alongside his father and it stretched over most of the Hellenistic world of his time. Indeed, the breadth of his vision gave rise to his grand strategy of conquering Rome by opening a northern front and subduing allied city-states on the peninsula, rather than by attacking Rome directly. Historical events which led to the defeat of Carthage during the First Punic War when his father commanded the Carthaginian army also led Hannibal to plan the invasion of Italy by land across the Alps. The task was daunting, to say the least. It involved the mobilization of between 60,000 and 100,000 troops and the training of a war elephant corps, all of which had to be provisioned along the way. The Alpine invasion of Italy was a military operation that would shake the Mediterranean world of 218 quith repercussions for more than two decades. Hannibal's perilous march brought him into the Roman territory and frustrated the attempts of the enemy to fight out the main issue on foreign ground. Out his sudden appearance among the Gauls of the Po Valley, moreover, enabled him to detach those tribes from their new allegiance to the Romans before the Romans could take steps to check the rebellion. Publius Cornelius Scipio was the consul who commanded the Roman force sent to intercept Hannibal, he was also Scipio Africanus' father. He had not expected Hannibal to make an attempt to cross the Alps, since the Romans were prepared to fight the war in the Iberian Peninsula. With a small detachment still positioned in Gaul, Scipio made an attempt to intercept Hannibal. He succeeded through prompt decision and speedy movement, in transporting his army to Italy by sea in time to meet Hannibal. Hannibal's forces moved through the Po Valley and were engaged in the Battle of Ticinus. Here, Hannibal forced the Romans to evacuate the plain of Lombardy, by virtue of his superior cavalry. The victory was minor, but it encouraged the Gauls and Ligurians to join the Carthaginian cause, 
whose troops bolstered his army back to around 40,000 men. Scipio was severely injured, his life only saved by the bravery of his son who rode back onto the field to rescue his fallen father. Scipio retreated across the Trebia to camp at Placentia with his army mostly intact. The other Roman consular army was rushed to the Po Valley. Even before news of the defeat at Tessinus had reached Rome, the Senate had ordered Consul Tiberius Sempronius Longus to bring his army back from Sicily to meet Scipio and face Hannibal. Hannibal, by skillful maneuvers, was in position to head him off, for he lay on the direct road between Placentia and Arminum, by which Sempronius would have to march to reinforce Scipio. He then captured Clastidium, from which he drew large amounts of supplies for his men. But this gain was not without loss, as Sempronius avoided Hannibal's watchfulness, slipped around his flank, and joined his colleague in his camp near the Trebia River near Placentia. There Hannibal had an opportunity to show his masterful military skill at the Trebia in December of the same year, after wearing down the superior Roman infantry, when he cut it to pieces with a surprise attack and ambush from the flanks. Hannibal quartered his troops for the winter with the Gauls, whose support for him had abated. In the spring of 217 BC, Hannibal decided to find a more reliable base of operations farther south. Gnaeus Servilius and Gaius Flaminius, the new consuls of Rome, were expecting Hannibal to advance on Rome, and they took their armies to block the eastern and western routes that Hannibal could use. The only alternative route to central Italy lay at the mouth of the Arno. This area was practically one huge marsh, and happened to be overflowing more than usual during this particular season. Hannibal knew that this route was full of difficulties, but it remained the surest and certainly the quickest way to central Italy. Polybius claims that Hannibal's men marched for four days and three nights, through a land that was underwater, suffering terribly from fatigue and enforced want of sleep. He crossed without opposition over both the Apennines, during which he lost his right eye because of conjunctivitis, and the seemingly impassable Arno, but he lost a large part of his force in the marshy lowlands of the Arno. He arrived in Etruria in the spring of 217 BC and decided to lure the main Roman army under Flaminius into a pitched battle by devastating the region that Flaminius had been sent to protect. As Polybius recounts, he, Hannibal, calculated that, if he passed the camp and made a descent into the district beyond, Flaminius, partly for fear of popular reproach and partly of personal irritation, would be unable to endure watching passively the devastation of the country but would spontaneously follow him and give him opportunities for attack. At the same time, Hannibal tried to break the allegiance of Rome's allies by proving that Flaminius was powerless to protect them. Despite this, Flaminius remained passively encamped at Aricium. Hannibal marched boldly around Flaminius' left flank, unable to draw him into battle by mere devastation, and effectively cut him off from Rome, thus executing the first recorded turning movement in military history. He then advanced through the uplands of Etruria provoking Flaminius into a hasty pursuit and catching him in a defile on the shore of Lake Trasimenus. There Hannibal destroyed Flaminius' army in the waters or on the adjoining slopes, killing Flaminius as well, see Battle of Lake Trasimene. This was the most costly ambush that the Romans ever sustained until the Battle of Cari against the Parthian Empire. Hannibal had now disposed of the only field force that could check his advance upon Rome, but he realized that, without siege engines, he could not hope to take the capital. He preferred to exploit his victory by entering into central and southern Italy and encouraging a general revolt against sovereign power. The Romans appointed Quintus Fabius Maximus Ferrucosus as their dictator. Departing from Roman military traditions, Fabius adopted the strategy named after him, avoiding open battle while placing several Roman armies in Hannibal's vicinity in order to watch and limit his movements. Hannibal ravaged Apulia but was unable to bring Fabius to battle so he decided to march through Samnium to Campania, one of the richest and most fertile provinces of Italy, hoping that the devastation would draw Fabius into battle. Fabius closely followed Hannibal's path of destruction, yet still refused to let himself be drawn out of the defensive. This strategy was unpopular with many Romans, who believed that it was a form of cowardice. Hannibal decided that it would be unwise to winter in the already devastated lowlands of Campania, but Fabius had ensured that all the passes were blocked out of Campania. To avoid this, Hannibal deceived the Romans into thinking that the Carthaginian army was going to escape through the woods. As the Romans moved off towards the woods, Hannibal's army occupied the pass, and then made their way through the pass unopposed. Fabius was within striking distance, but in this case, his caution worked against him. Smelling a stratagem, rightly, he stayed put. For the winter, Hannibal found comfortable quarters in the Apulian plain. 
What Hannibal achieved in extricating his army was, as Adrian Goldsworthy puts it, a classic of ancient generalship, finding its way into nearly every historical narrative of the war and being used by later military manuals. This was a severe blow to Fabius' prestige and soon after this his period of dictatorial power ended. In the spring of 216 BC, Hannibal took the initiative and seized the large supply depot at Cannae in the Apulian plain. By capturing Cannae, Hannibal had placed himself between the Romans and their crucial sources of supply. Once the Roman Senate resumed their consular elections in 216 BC, they appointed Gaius Terentius Varro and Lucius Aemilius Paulus as consuls. In the meantime, the Romans hoped to gain success through sheer strength and weight of numbers, and they raised a new army of unprecedented size, estimated by some to be as large as 100,000 men, but more likely around 50 to 80,000. The Romans and allied legions resolved to confront Hannibal and marched southward to Apulia. They eventually found him on the left bank of the Aufidus River, and encamped away. On this occasion, the two armies were combined into one the consuls having to alternate their command on a daily basis. Varro was in command on the first day, a man of reckless and hubristic nature, according to Livy, and determined to defeat Hannibal. Hannibal capitalized on the eagerness of Varro and drew him into a trap by using an envelopment tactic. This eliminated the Roman numerical advantage by shrinking the combat area. Hannibal drew up his least reliable infantry in a semicircle in the center with the wings composed of the Gallic and Numidian horse. The Roman legions forced their way through Hannibal's weak center, but the Libyan mercenaries on the wings, swung around by the movement, menaced their flanks. The onslaught of Hannibal's cavalry was irresistible. Hannibal's chief cavalry commander Maharbal led the mobile Numidian cavalry on the right, and they shattered the Roman cavalry opposing them. Hannibal's Iberian and Gallic heavy cavalry led by Hanno on the left, defeated the Roman heavy cavalry, and then both the Carthaginian heavy cavalry and the Numidians attacked the legions from behind. As a result, the Roman army was hemmed in with no means of escape. Due to these brilliant tactics, Hannibal managed to surround and destroy all but a small remnant of his enemy, despite his own inferior numbers. Depending upon the source, it is estimated that 50,000 to 70,000 Romans were killed or captured. Among the dead were Roman consul Lucius Aemilius Paulus, as well as two consuls for the preceding year, two quaestors, 29 out of the 48 military tribunes, and an additional 80 senators. At a time when the Roman Senate was composed of no more than 300 men, this constituted 25% to 30% of the governing body. This makes the battle one of the most catastrophic defeats in the history of ancient Rome, and one of the bloodiest battles in all of human history in terms of the number of lives lost within a single day. After Cannae, the Romans were very hesitant to confront Hannibal in pitched battle, preferring instead to weaken him by attrition, relying on their advantage off interior lines, supply, and manpower. As a result, Hannibal fought no more major battles in Italy for the rest of the war. It is believed that his refusal to bring the war to Rome itself was due to a lack of commitment from Carthage of men, money, and material, principally siege equipment. Whatever the reason, the choice prompted Maharbal to say, Hannibal, you know how to gain a victory, but not how to use one. As a result of this victory, many parts of Italy joined Hannibal's cause. As Polybius notes, how much more serious was the defeat of Cannae, than those that preceded it can be seen by the behavior of Rome's allies, before that fateful day, their loyalty remained unshaken, now it began to waver for the simple reason that they despaired of Roman power. During that same year, the Greek cities in Sicily were induced to rebuild against Roman political control, while Macedonian King Philip V pledged his support to Hannibal, thus initiating the First Macedonian War against Rome. Hannibal also secured an alliance with newly appointed tyrant Hieronymus of Syracuse. It is often argued that, if Hannibal had received proper material reinforcements from Carthage, he might have succeeded with a direct attack upon Rome. Instead, he had to content himself with subduing the fortresses that still held out against him, and the only other notable event of 216 BC was the defection of certain Italian territories, including Capua, the second largest city of Italy, which Hannibal made his new base. However, only a few of the Italian city-states defected to him that he had expected to gain as allies. The war in Italy settled into a strategic stalemate. The Romans used the attritional strategy that Fabius had taught them, and which, they finally realized, was the only feasible means of defeating Hannibal. Indeed, Fabius received the name Conctator, the Delayer, 
because of his policy of not meeting Hannibal in open battle but through attrition. The Romans deprived Hannibal of a large scale battle and instead assaulted his weakening army with multiple smaller armies in an attempt to both weary him and create unrest in his troops. For the next few years, Hannibal was forced to sustain a scorched earth policy and obtain local provisions for protracted and ineffectual operations throughout southern Italy. His immediate objectives were reduced to minor operations centered mainly around the cities of Campania. The forces detached to his lieutenants were generally unable to hold their own, and neither his home government nor his new ally Philip V of Macedon helped had to make up his losses. His position in southern Italy, therefore, became increasingly difficult and his chance of ultimately conquering Rome grew ever more remote. Hannibal still won a number of notable victories, completely destroying two Roman armies in 212 BC and killing two consuls, including the famed Marcus Claudius Marcellus, in a battle in 208 BC. However, Hannibal slowly began losing ground, inadequately supported by his Italian allies, abandoned by his government, either because of jealousy or simply because Carthage was overstretched, and unable to match Rome's resources. He was never able to bring about another grand decisive victory that could produce a lasting strategic change. Carthaginian political will was embodied in the ruling oligarchy. There was a Carthaginian Senate, but the real power was with the inner council of thirty nobles and the board of judges from ruling families known as the Hundred and Four. These two bodies came from the wealthy, commercial families of Carthage. Two political factions operated in Carthage, the War Party, also known as the Barsids, Hannibal's family name, and the Peace Party led by Hanno II the Great. Hanno had been instrumental in denying Hannibal's requested reinforcements following the Battle of Cannae. Hannibal started the war without the full backing of Carthaginian oligarchy. His attack of Saguntum had presented the oligarchy with a choice of war with Rome or loss of prestige in Iberia. The oligarchy, not Hannibal, controlled the strategic resources of Carthage. Hannibal constantly sought reinforcements from either Iberia or North Africa. Hannibal's troops who were lost in combat were replaced with less well-trained and motivated mercenaries from Italy or Gaul. The commercial interests of the Carthaginian oligarchy dictated the reinforcement and supply of Iberia rather than Hannibal throughout the campaign. In March 212 BC, Hannibal captured Tarentum in a surprise attack but he failed to obtain control of its harbor. The tide was slowly turning against him, and in favor of Rome. The Roman consuls mounted a siege of Capua in 212 BC. Hannibal attacked them, forcing their withdrawal from Campania. He moved to Lucania and destroyed the 16,000 man Roman army at the Battle of the Silarus, with 15,000 Romans killed. Another opportunity presented itself soon after, a Roman army of 18,000 men being destroyed by Hannibal at the First Battle of Herdonia with 16,000 Roman dead, freeing Apulia from the Romans for the year. The Roman consuls mounted another siege of Capua in 211 BC. Conquering the city. Hannibal attempted to lift the siege with an assault on the Roman siege lines but failed. He marched on Rome to force the recall of the Roman armies. He drew off 15,000 Roman soldiers, but the siege continued and Capua fell. In 212 BC, Marcellus conquered Syracuse and the Romans destroyed the Carthaginian army in Sicily in 211 210 BC. In 210 BC, the Romans entered into an alliance with the Aetolian League to counter Philip V of Macedon. Philip who attempted to exploit Rome's preoccupation in Italy to conquer Illyria, now found himself under attack from several sides at once and was quickly subdued by Rome and her Greek allies. In 210 BC, Hannibal again proved his superiority in tactics by inflicting a severe defeat at the Battle of Herdonia, modern Ordona, in Apulia upon a proconsular army and, in 208 BC, destroyed a Roman force engaged in the siege of Locri at the Battle of Petelia. But with the loss of Tarentum in 209 BC and the gradual reconquest by the Romans of Samnium and Lucania, his hold on South Italy was almost lost. In 207 BC, he succeeded in making his way again into Apulia, where he waited to concert measures for a combined march upon Rome with his brother Hasdrubal Barca. On hearing, however, of his brother's defeat and death at the Battle of the Metaurus, he retired to Calabria, where he maintained himself for the ensuing years. His brother's head had been cut off carried across Italy, and tossed over the palisade of Hannibal's camp as a cold message of the ironclad will of the Roman Republic. The combination of these events marked the end to Hannibal's success in Italy. With the failure of his brother Mago in Liguria, 205-203 BC, and of his own negotiations with Philip B, the last hope of recovering his ascendancy in Italy was lost. In 203 BC, after nearly 15 years of fighting in Italy, 
and with the military fortunes off Carthage rapidly declining, Hannibal was recalled to Carthage to direct the defense of his native country against a Roman invasion under Scipio Africanus. In 203 BC, Hannibal was recalled from Italy by the war party in Carthage. After leaving a record of his expedition engraved in Punic and Greek upon bronze table seen the Temple of Juno Lacinia at Cretona, he sailed back to Africa. His arrival immediately restored the predominance of the war party, which placed him in command of the combined force of African levies and his mercenaries from Italy. In 202 BC, Hannibal met Scipio in a fruitless peace conference. Despite mutual admiration, negotiations floundered due to Roman allegations of Punic faith, referring to the breach of protocols that ended the First Punic War by the Carthaginian attack on Saguntum, and a Carthaginian attack on a stranded Roman fleet. Scipio and Carthage had worked out a peace plan, which was approved by Rome. The terms of the treaty were quite modest, but the war had been long for the Romans. Carthage could keep its African territory but would lose its overseas empire. Massinissa, Nermidia, was to be independent. Also, Carthage was to reduce its fleet and pay a war indemnity. But Carthage then made a terrible blunder. Its long suffering citizens had captured a stranded Roman fleet in the Gulf of Tunis and stripped it of supplies, an action that aggravated the faltering negotiations. Meanwhile, Hannibal, recalled from Italy by the Carthaginian Senate, had returned with his army. Fortified by both Hannibal and the supplies, the Carthaginians rebuffed the treaty and Roman protests stopped the decisive Battle of Zama soon followed, the defeat removed Hannibal's air of invincibility. Unlike most battles of the Second Punic War, at Zama, the Romans were superior in cavalry and the Carthaginians had the edge in infantry. This Roman cavalry superiority was due to the betrayal of Massinissa, who had earlier assisted Carthage in Iberia, but changed sides in 206 BC with the promise of land and due to his personal conflicts with Syphax, a Carthaginian ally. Although the aging Hannibal was suffering from mental exhaustion and deteriorating health after years of campaigning in Italy, the Carthaginians still had the advantage in numbers and were boosted by the presence of 80 war elephants. The Roman cavalry won an early victory by swiftly routing the Carthaginian horse, and standard Roman tactics for limiting the effectiveness of the Carthaginian or elephants were successful, including playing trumpets to frighten the elephants into running into the Carthaginian lines. Some historians say that the elephants routed the Carthaginian cavalry and not the Romans, whilst others suggest that it was actually a tactical retreat planned by Hannibal. Whatever the truth, the battle remained closely fought. At one point, it seemed that Hannibal was on the verge of victory, but Scipio was able to rally his men, and his cavalry, having routed the Carthaginian cavalry, attacked Hannibal's rear. This two pronged attack caused the Carthaginian formation to collapse. With their foremost general defeated, the Carthaginians had no choice but to surrender. Carthage lost approximately 20,000 troops with an additional 15,000 wounded. In contrast, the Romans suffered only 2,500 casualties. The last major battle of the Second Punic War resulted in a loss of respect for Hannibal by his fellow Carthaginians. The conditions of defeat were such that Carthage could no longer battle for Mediterranean supremacy. Hannibal was still only 46 at the conclusion of the Second Punic War in 201 BC and soon showed that he could be a statesman as well as a soldier. Following the conclusion of a peace that left Carthage saddled with an indemnity of 10,000 talents, he was elected Safit, chief magistrate, of the Carthaginian state. After an audit confirmed Carthage had the resources to pay the indemnity without increasing taxation, Hannibal initiated a reorganization of state finance aimed at eliminating corruption and recovering embezzled funds. The principal beneficiaries of these financial peculations had been the oligarchs of the 104. In order to reduce the power of the oligarchs, Hannibal passed a law stipulating the 104 be chosen by direct election rather than co-option. He also used citizen support to change the term of office in the 104 from life to a year, with none permitted to hold office for two consecutive years. Seven years after the victory of Zama, the Romans, alarmed by Carthage's renewed prosperity and suspicious that Hannibal had been in contact with Antiochus I of Syria, sent a delegation to Carthage alleging Hannibal was helping an enemy of Rome. Aware that he had many enemies, not least of which due to his financial reforms eliminating opportunities for oligarchical graft, Hannibal fled into voluntary exile before the Romans could demand that Carthage surrender him into their custody. He journeyed first to Tyre, the mother city of Carthage, and then to Antioch, before he finally reached Ephesus, 
where he was honorably received by Antiochus. Livy states that the Seleucid king consulted Hannibal on the strategic concerns of making war on Rome. The Carthaginian general advised equipping a fleet and landing a body of troops in the south of Italy, offering to take command himself. According to Cicero, while at the court of Antiochus, Hannibal attended a lecture by Formio, a philosopher, that ranged through many topics. When Formio finished a discourse on the duties of a general, Hannibal was asked his opinion. He replied, I have seen during my life many old fools, but this one beats them all. Another story, according to Aulus Gellius, is that when Antiochus III showed off the gigantic and elaborately equipped army he had created to invade Greece to Hannibal, he asked him if they would be enough for the Roman Republic, to which Hannibal replied, I think all this will be enough, yes, quite enough, for the Romans, even though they are most avaricious. In 191 BC, the Romans under Manius Acilius Glabrio routed Antiochus at the Battle of Thermopylae and obliged him to withdraw to Asia. The Romans followed up their success by attacking Antiochus in Anatolia, and the Seleucid Empire was decisively defeated at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 BC. Lucius Cornelius Scipio Asiaticus. In 190 BC, Hannibal was placed in command of a Seleucid fleet but was defeated in the Battle of the Eurymedon. According to Strabo and Plutarch, Hannibal also received hospitality at the Armenian royal court of Artaxias I. The authors add an apocryphal story of how Hannibal planned and supervised the building of the new royal capital Artaxida. Suspicious that Antiochus was prepared to surrender him to the Romans, Hannibal fled to Crete, but he soon went back to Anatolia and sought refuge with Prusias I of Bithynia, who was engaged in warfare with Rome's ally, King Eumenes II of Pergamon. Hannibal went on to serve Prusias in this war. During one of the naval victories he gained over Eumenes, Hannibal had large pots filled with venomous snakes thrown onto Eumenes' ships. Hannibal also went on to defeat Eumenes in two other battles on land. At this stage, the Romans intervened and threatened Bithynia into giving up Hannibal. Prusias agreed, but the general was determined not to fall into his enemy's hands. The precise year and cause of Hannibal's death are unknown. Pausanias wrote that Hannibal's death occurred after his finger was wounded by his drawn sword while mounting his horse, resulting in a fever and then his death three days later. Juvenal asserts that his death was at Libysa on the eastern shore of the Sea of Marmara, after having taken poison, which he had long carried about with him in a ring. Before dying, he left behind a letter declaring, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. In his annal, Titus Pomponius Atticus reports that Hannibal's death occurred in 183 BC, and Livy implies the same. Polybius, who wrote nearest the event, gives 182 BC. Sulpicius Blitho records the death under 181 BC. Hannibal caused great distress to many in Roman society. He became such a figure of terror that whenever disaster struck, the Roman senators would exclaim, Hannibal is at the gates, to express their fear or anxiety. This famous Latin phrase became a common expression that is often still used when a client arrives through the door or when one is faced with calamity. The works of Roman writers such as Livy, 64 or 59 BC to AD 12 or 17, Frontinus, 40 to 103 AD, and Juvenal, 1st to 2nd century AD, show a grudging admiration for Hannibal. The Romans even built statues of the Carthaginian in the very streets of Rome to advertise their defeat of such a worthy adversary. It is plausible to suggest that Hannibal engendered the greatest fear Rome had towards an enemy. Nevertheless, the Romans grimly refused to admit the possibility of defeat and rejected all overtures for peace. They even refused to accept the ransom of prisoners after Cannae. During the war, there are no reports of revolutions among the Roman citizens, no factions within the Senate desiring peace no pro-Carthaginian Roman turncoats, no coups. Indeed, throughout the war Roman aristocrats ferociously competed with each other for positions of command to fight against Rome's most dangerous enemy. Hannibal's military genius was not enough to really disturb the Roman political process and the collective political and military capacity of the Roman people. As Lazenby states, it says volumes, too for their political maturity and respect for constitutional forms that the complicated machinery of government continued to function even amidst disaster, there are few states in the ancient world in which a general who had lost a battle like Cannae would have dared to remain, let alone would have continued to be treated respectfully as head of state. According to the historian Livy, the Romans feared Hannibal's military genius, and during Hannibal's march against Rome in 211 BC a messenger who had traveled from Frigilae for a day and a night without stopping created great alarm in Rome 
and the excitement was increased by people running about the city with wildly exaggerated accounts of the news he had brought. The wailing cry of the matrons was heard everywhere, not only in private houses but even in the temples. Here they knelt and swept the temple floors with their disheveled hair and lifted up their hands to heaven in piteous entreaty to the gods that they would deliver the city of Rome out of the hands of the enemy and preserve its mothers and children from injury and outrage. In the Senate the news was received with varying feelings as men's temperaments differed, so it was decided to keep Capua under siege, but to send 15,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry as reinforcements to Rome. According to Livy, the land occupied by Hannibal's army outside Rome in 211 BC was sold at the very time of its occupation and for the same price. This may not be true, but as Lazenby states, could well be, exemplifying as it does not only the supreme confidence felt by the Romans in ultimate victory, but also the way in which something like normal life continued. After Cannae the Romans showed a considerable steadfastness in adversity. An undeniable proof of Rome's confidence is demonstrated by the fact that after the Cannae disaster she was left virtually defenseless, but the Senate still chose not to withdraw a single garrison from an overseas province to strengthen the city. In fact, they were reinforced and the campaigns tier maintained until victory was secured, beginning first in Sicily under the direction of Claudius Marcellus and later in Hispania under Scipio Africanus. Although the long-term consequences of Hannibal's war are debatable, this war was undeniably Rome's finest hour. Most of the sources available to historians about Hannibal are from Romans. They considered him the greatest enemy Rome had ever faced. Livy gives us the idea that Hannibal was extremely cruel. Even Cicero, when he talked of Rome and its two great enemies, spoke of the honorable Pyrrhus and the cruel Hannibal. Yet a different picture sometimes emerges. When Hannibal's successes had brought about the death of two Roman consuls, he vainly searched for the body of Gaius Flaminius on the shores of Lake Trasimene, held ceremonial rituals in recognition of Lucius Aemilius Paulus, and sent Marcellus' ashes back to his family in Rome. Any bias attributed to Polybius, however, is more troublesome. Ronald Meller considered the Greek scholar a loyal partisan of Scipio Emiljanus, while H. Ormerod does not view him as an altogether unprejudiced witness when it came to his pet peeves the Aetolians, the Carthaginians, and the Cretans. Nonetheless, Polybius did recognize that the reputation for cruelty the Romans attached to Hannibal Barca might in reality have been due to mistaking him for one of his officers, Hannibal Monomachus. Hannibal is generally regarded as one of the best military strategists and tacticians of all time, the double envelopment of Cannae and enduring legacy of tactical brilliance. According to Appian, several years after the Second Punic War, Hannibal served as a political advisor in the Seleucid Kingdom and Scipio was sent there on a diplomatic mission from Rome. Military academies all over the world continue to study Hannibal's exploits, especially his victory at Cannae. Maximilian Otto Bismarck Caspari, in his article in the Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition, praises Hannibal in these words. Even the Roman chroniclers acknowledged Hannibal's supreme military leadership, writing that, he never required others to do what he could and would not do himself. According to Polybius 23, 13, p. 423, Count Alfred von Schlieffen developed his eponymously titled Schlieffen Plan, 1905-1906, from his military studies, with a particularly heavy emphasis one envelopment technique which Hannibal employed to surround and destroy the Roman army in the Battle of Cannae. George S. Patton believed himself a reincarnation of Hannibal as well as of many other people including the Roman legionary and a Napoleonic soldier. Norman Schwarzkopf Jr., the commander of the Coalition of the Gulf War, claimed, the technology of war may change, the sophistication of weapons certainly changes. But those same principles of war that applied to the days of Hannibal apply today. According to the military historian Theodore Aero Dodge. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.